Mr. Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Both sides. Here are, oh, look at these. These are the charts for the, uh, if you can see them, for the solitaire system. So this one is the Japanese opening, so that's just faint, you know, it uses for like the first couple of turns of the game. And then, as you can see in the back, this is the two Japanese flags that's for the middle part of the war. We have here the U.S. one for the, and this is the one we've been playing on uh, line lately, so this is the chart I've been using. Uh, as we've been uh, rolling through this thing. And here's the Allied middle of the war phase. And of course, all wars must come to an end. The last chart, let's see here, is the Japanese uh, end of the game on one side, Allied end of the game on the other side. So those are the three. Oh, a beautiful, nice cardstock, all that. I'm now going to show the six Erasmus Solitaire charts in succession. The number of flags in the upper center of each chart shows you whether it's the opening with one flag, middle game with two flags, or the end game in three flags, and there's one set for each side. The blue ones are the Allied charts, and the uh, mustard colored ones are the Japanese charts. Each chart has five sections. The left side, you'll see a series of columns with uh, green and red arrows. That's the axis of advanced determination portion. That's where Erasmus picks uh, his strategy for a particular card and, and turn of the game. Below that, there's a box in the lower left of the left side. That's the reaction portion. So when Erasmus is going to react to a play, those are the rules for how he will react. The right portion of the chart has three sections. You'll see in the upper... Um, Upper portion, it's, it says card selection. That's how cards are selected to be played against the axis of advanced determination. Below that is a large box. You can see a small matrix, a long uh, rectangular matrix with rules under it. That's how Erasmus picks the forces that will go to an actual objective hex and conduct operations. And below it, the last box, is the PBM or post-battle movement box. I will now use an example of how to actually implement some of these instructions in the next portion of the video. Okay, uh, one of the things I wanted to do with this video was get it on the uh, up on YouTube and in everybody's hands before the game, uh, the Empire of the Sun games actually get into your hands. Uh, the game actually got here faster than I thought. Uh, it's apparently being unloaded in Oakland and then it's gonna go to Hanford and they have to do what they do for it there and then it all gets to your houses. And my concern was that some of you might have it before I got to do this video, and the uh, my my good copy of the game, you know, the one real copy of the game that I had that got, as you saw in the unboxing video, is at another location for about another week because I'm not there. I'm somewhere else, and so I decided that I would shoot the video. This is actually my um, final playtest version of the game, so it's you know the same colors and all that, but it's a you know it's a it's a printed out map, not the mounted board. So anybody saying, oh my god, it doesn't have a mounted board. Yeah, it does. You saw that. Just go look at the unboxing video. That's got the real stuff. But I wanted to get this tutorial out because, again, a bunch of you are going to get your hands on the game. And you're going to, you know, obviously, if you know how to play the game or if you didn't, you're going to quickly want to jump in and play with the uh, bots, which seems to be getting a lot of excitement. By the way, just so you know, from now on, I'm going to use the bot's official term. It's Erasmus. I like giving uh, a name to the bot. And what I'm going to do right now is uh, I'm going to deal out the cards because I... I you know, you got to deal with the cards. I couldn't figure out how to get the graphic up on the computer easily. And so I just decided that I would just do my traditional shuffle of cards and put them out there. Uh, these cards, again, are not the real, the real cards, by the way, are gorgeous, just so you know. But uh, let's see what we can do about Okay, uh, obviously these are not the production cards. The production cards, by the way, are gorgeous. But these are just my uh, printed out playtest cards that are sleeved. Uh, so the red ones are the uh, Japanese deck, the blue ones are the Allied deck, and the Allies will start with Arcadia. So I'm just going to deal out the cards so we can see what we're going to deal with with the bot. So we've got U.S. Army Navy Disputes, so that's a uh, 
you know, an ISR card. We have Indian Workers Party. Uh, it's a Gandhi card. We have Chiang Kai-shek. So we've got a lot of uh, CBI stuff looking on, you know, early on. Japanese aircraft production is a good resource. So now let's see what we get. Okay, Big Tokyo Express. So there's your probably one of your main um, offensive events for this first turn. Let's hope we get another. Oh, Colonel Suji, an excellent card on the uh, opening hand. And lastly, oh, Hago. So I guess uh, a little clumping there, but we've got uh, three offensive events. We'll go back to how the bot deals with that in a moment. So let's move these aside to here. And now let's deal out the American cards, or the Allied cards, I should say. Oh, good. Australian Coast Watch is always a useful card early. Uh, Galvanic, nice surprise attack card. Probably could go into the future offensive queue. Oh, PT Boats, uh, good card early, uh, just to get, again, we're going to get more cards. We'll see how that plays out. And China Offensive. So those are the four cards, but as you saw, we have, I think, two draw cards in here. One... Yeah, there's two drawer cards in here, so just just for grin, so we'll know what's going to be. Again, we're playing this open hand solitaire, so whenever we play the first one, we're going to get a War in Europe card. That's uh, really nice, and the second drawer card is going to get a Typhoon. So we'll see those again later, but again, we're, I was just trying to be efficient about how I shoot the video. So there are our hands, and so now I'm going to go back to um, the bot logic and show you how you would now take this and turn it into... Uh, you know, a, a strategy and how you would play the game. What you're looking at in the upper right corner of this graphic is the card selection uh, portion of Erasmus Logic. Uh, the three Japanese ones are identical, the three American ones are identical, and the only difference between the Japanese and the American ones is number seven in what events you might save uh, to the turn. And what you need to do is you need to read all eight of these because they are in a priority order once you figure out from number seven which two cards you're going to save to the last two cards for the hand. So what the logic is basically doing is saying is Erasmus is going to come at you as, with the biggest club of activations it has early in the going, and it's just going to kind of do that as much as it can to achieve the objectives that it's, it's set out to do. And then when it gets to the last two cards, it's going to try to get a good, of you know, if there's a solid event, it's going to try to get it in there and it's going to try to save a card to the FOQ, or it's going to use that last card if it has to, to do something else. And, and so once you've saved uh, two cards, and if you, again, if there's no cards on the list, the last case is roll random die roll and save two cards. But again, you're going to end up having five cards to use with two in reserve for the end of the turn. Uh, if you have an FOQ card, you'll have six. But the idea is you're going to use up these cards and to, uh, to do what the uh, logic says. And line two is saying, First, you're going to pick, if you, have a mil if you have military events, you're going to first take a military event, and the biggest one with no, restrict with no restrictions for activations or battle hex restrictions. It could have HQ restrictions, which is okay, but it does doesn't have uh, activation and battle hex restrictions. And so you're going to take the strongest event card you have there. Uh, this could be one of the force cards for the Japanese, you know, the East Force, West Force, Central Force cards. It could be... Um, Card 23, which is uh, Operation RE, Attack on Milne Bay, which just says, you know, any HQ, log value of three. So those are the cards that kind of fall into category on line two of the logic. The third line says, well, if you, if you don't have a card like that at the moment, you might have played it already or you never even had one. Now you're going to try to look for cards based on the kind of restrictions in a priority order. So if you have a card that restricts you to air and naval uh, units, then you're going to use that one first. If you have a card that restricts you to air units, only you're going to use that next and so on down this list to generate uh, activations. And then number four says that if somehow the restrictions or whatever you got to accomplish in the objective don't meet the cards that you have, you're going to use the military event as an OC. And then number five is really a repeat of number four other than adding in if you don't have ASPs to do it or other things, you're going to use it as an o OC card. And this is a place where I've made it I've made it that you're going to use up the military events first and use the OC cards next. But if you're going to be using a really good military event as an OC that you think in your mind can be used later a different way, you should feel free to substitute in an OC card with the same value to go do what you would have done with the military event as an OC. But again, if you want to, if you want to be strict that you would use up all your military events first, even if you use them as OCs and you end up using your OC cards and at the end you'd use these last two cards. 
and so that's the broad logic that is being applied here. And now we're going to look at the Japanese hand and see how that would apply to, to the hand that we actually got. The concept covered in the rules is the logistics evaluation value of a hand. Uh, this particular hand that you're going to see in a sec that we've you're going to see in the second that was dealt out earlier is going to be a value of 19, and that will factor into how decisions are made by the bot. So now we're in the upper left portion of the uh, Erasmus bot logic, and we're looking, and again, these are these columns of logic that go from left to right. So the first thing we're looking at on the first card is if HQs at a supply, then, you know, the green arrow go to if DEI surrender objectives are occupied then, etc. But as it turns out, in the very beginning of the game, the allied HQs in are in supply. And so the next, so you go down the red arrow, which then says, if you have two greater than two cards so again remember the logic is always those last two cards are being saved so it says that if greater than two cards and the japanese control less than 12 resource hexes which is true it only they only control four and allied hqs in the philippines that's macarthur southwest pack hq and malaya that's the malay hq are in supply then you're going to go for air superiority which is you know the logic is it's going to try to knock out and gain air superiority like they did historically and so that's the basic logic that you're going to so we're now we're moving down to the next thing air superiority strategy okay so now we're looking at just a little bit lower in that column but i wanted to tighten in on it uh we're looking at the air superiority strategy objective aggressive now we had a log value for our hand of 19 so this portion doesn't apply because you need a 20 plus to look here but you can sort of see that the big difference is going to be it's going to be more aggressive about going for the a dei surrender in the first turn versus going for a DEI neutralization. And again, as you go further down the column, the, each one has a little bit more detail of what that means. However, we're going for a conservative, and so the objective is to put the allied HQs in the Philippines and Malaya at a supply under an unneutralized AZOI. That's, and then after that, we're gonna to try to do DEI neutralization. So those are the basic strategies we're gonna follow for uh, this particular hand of cards this turn. Okay, so now we're gonna pick that first card, and without, if you remember the logic, uh, the big Tokyo Express card will allow us to activate any kind of, it has a restriction. The restriction is only one ground unit, but we can activate air, naval, and ground. And so the big Tokyo Express card is the first card. Uh, the reason that Suji wasn't picked, it's got ground only, and Hago is air and ground. So this card allows any kind of activation with the restriction. And although we denigrated it in the, um, the log evaluation by one, uh, it still has uh, the best, the least activation restrictions, and so it's the card that's going to get picked. So now we're actually generating the objectives. So what are we actually going to do? Now, this is this particular first two lines has objectives for both. So whether you're doing an aggressive or a conservative strategy, it's the same basic strategy. First, we're going to try to bring Manila. So everything. So the way this works is you pick an objective hex, and then you create a task force, which we're going to cover shortly. That's going to go after that objective hex. So we, and, I, and you name it for the objective hex. So in other words, we're going to create Task Force Manila, and then we're going to have to create Task Force Singapore, whatever that is. A task force is you know, some combination of air, land, and naval units. And this particular one's giving you a criteria that you have to attack Manila with enough air naval strength so that a 0.25x or whatever you apply is going to eliminate everything in the Manila hex. And because the unit has a defense of 10, if we look at it, it's, a, it's uh, the Far East Air Force uh, air unit, is, it requires 10 hits. We're going to have to bring 38, again, you have to look at the chart, you, there's a rounding up thing. We have to get 38 or more factors to hit Manila to meet that criteria. Then if you, once you meet that criteria, the activations, and what you're going to do, we have to hit Singapore with an air naval that a half x, you know, 0.5x uh, hits of whatever force we bring would be sufficient to eliminate everything in the Singapore space. And so since the uh, Far East Air Force is at full strength with a defense of nine, it, has, it takes 18 hits to kill it. And therefore to achieve that, we have to bring 36 factors because a 0.5x of 36 factors would be 18, which would be enough to kill it. And that's what we'd have to apply in this situation. And then, once we get that accomplished, we have any more activation, we start moving down the DEI, not the surrender ones, because that would be for the aggressive, but we go down the DEI neutralization of conservative, and 
uh, used for extra activations. And we'll see that it goes Jolo, Macassar, Quanton, etc. But because the big Tokyo Express card has a restriction, which is we can only activate one ground unit, we're going to have to stop at Jolo. So we're going to go take Jolo as a, with, with, the, with the one ground unit we're going to activate. And then extra activations, uh, and again, there's another portion of this chart, which I can come back to, but it's basically saying if you have extra activations, you're going to start hitting air and naval assets in the, um, in the amongst these objectives. So we're going to look around and whatever you have the close, you know, so we're going to start trying to sink uh, Dutch and uh, allied naval or air units with whatever we can bring to bear. So that's going to be sort of what we do with the rest. So, okay, so having done the math, uh, and again, this is where you get to use your own brain uh it can't tell you there's there's obviously you know 100 units on the board and so you got to find the right combinations and to meet the objectives and there's multiple ways to do that and you have two ways of doing that in this game you can either one uh, come up with a combinate couple of combinations and roll the dice and pick which one goes or pick the one that you think is best uh, again that's and in this case we're going to bring 38 factors to bear on um on Manila by using this air unit here which has got 22 and it doesn't matter which one but we'll, well let's say we're going to use this one 16 and 22 and 16 is 38 which will be sufficient to kill the FF HQ then we're going to use this 36 uh, strength unit coupled with this 20 strength unit which is going to give us 36 to attack Singapore as we said then the next thing is we we go to the objective we're going to go after Jolo so again you could pick any ground unit but the best one would be a naval unit that's not in a port hex uh, to send that against Jolo but we again it would be nice if we could do more ground units but that's the only one we can do and then with those last two activations we're going to activate the battleship and the cruiser here and they're going to go after and again you can pick if there's multiple hexes you can roll the dice but what we're going to do is we're going to try to uh, knock out the destroy. If you look down the the list of objectives, since uh, Balak, Papin, Manila, Singapore, Quanton are all on the list, uh, we're going to try to do some things to um, support those su support those actions. And so we're going to attack various air naval assets to try to give uh, an edge to the the, the uh, Japanese and what's going to happen later in the turn. And again, if you have multiple choices going out, which air naval assets you should go after, roll the dice. Uh, in this case, what I've chosen to do is I am going to go for uh, knocking out the, uh, the battleship's going to go up against this uh, destroyer over here. And the, um, actually I'm going to send the cruise, well, it doesn't matter. They're both basically the same strength. I'll send one of them over here. And then I'm going to send the other one to knock out the U.S. Asia because, again, why am I taking out those two over anything else is I do know that if I can, there may be a way at the end of the turn to sink uh, the U.S. Navy, and if I can take these two, these two naval units are both U.S., taking these out gives me some advantage for the Japanese going forward, but you might decide that there's something else going on, but that's what we're going to do on this first turn. Okay, I've moved the units forward, but before we can do that, uh, as we all know from the sequence of play, we have a... Uh, potential allied reaction. Now, what the logic does say, and this again, I'm not going to show the chart here, but it, it basically says the the robot uh, Erasmus allied is going to try to use as many reaction cards as it has as quickly as it can, uh, except for ones that don't have a replacement card. In other words, counter-offensive cards and like Ord Wingate, where you don't get a replacement. One of the things that uh, the bot doesn't want to do is get into a card count problem. And so, it so happens that we do in fact have uh, Australian Coast Watchers, which is gonna give us the intercept uh, capability. In this case, there was air and naval units were used, so we get to use that card. And we get to draw a card, and we don't have to roll the dice for it, but uh, again, with uh, the HQs as they are, the reaction then says, can you bring forces to bear that'll change the relationship to a 1x reply? And the answer is, in no case, these are overwhelming attacks. You can't change it to a 1x. And so 
Erasmus will not react to anybody to send him into battle. Like, so another thing that Erasmus won't do is do suicide, suicide attacks or sacrifice units for no purpose. Uh, if there's a situation where you think that it's, it's a reasonable play because it changes the dynamics of a battle, I leave it to you to do that. But again, Erasmus will not react unless it, can, it has a good chance of you know, inflicting damage. Otherwise, it's not going to waste its resources. Okay, so let's just kind of run through it. So I've now moved the, this is Task Force Manila, which is two air units with a strength of 38. And we know for a fact they're going to get a 0.25 result, but we, I always love rolling the dice on videos. So to, we flip over to here where they, we have our, our dice, our dice uh, tower. And the result was, okay, I mean, it was a, a 9-1. So the allies, oh, by the way, the black die is always going to be the Japanese die. Allies do not score any hits, and our um, our poor Manila unit is removed to Battle B, which is uh, Singapore. And you can see we have a 20 and a 16, which is 36, which gives us our 0.5 against this air unit if we're successful. And so now let's roll the die. So we move around here. And we're going to zoom out so we can see what the actual dice are rolled. And the answer is, ah, this is a inter more interesting result. So the allies uh, scored a critical hit, so they're going to cause some damage. But uh, the, uh, the bot in this case did get a 7, which is a full strength, uh, gets full 36 hits, which is going to be sufficient. And so if we kind of zoom in here real quickly, uh, this unit's eliminated. However, the stronger unit, obviously you're always going to take the stronger unit, it's in the uh, rules, you're always going to do the thing that's in the best interest of the bot, that unit's going to be reduced because of the critical hit, and we've now concluded um, that uh, attack. We can see that the first special naval landing force has taken Jolo, there's no reaction to it. Um, Okay, so here's Battle C. Again, we've got a battleship going up against a destroyer, and we're now going to, you know, check out the dice again. And the dice say, well, the Japanese got a quarter result, which is not going to do much, and the Allies got a six result, which is not going to do anything. So, what we, a quarter result of 13 is a, f actually, it's a five, but, uh, and so, because you round up, but it doesn't really matter because the 13 will flip the destroyer, but it's not going to sink it. So that was a pretty uh, poor result. And then the last battle that we have is the destroyer is going up against that cruiser. And the die roll this time now is... Okay, so this time we did get 12 hits with the cruiser. The, um, the cruiser, the American cruiser, needed to get a critical hit. And so this unit is eliminated, which is going to be helpful because it takes, it clears Biok for later on. Now, the, the bot logic does post-battle movement. That's on the bottom of the right side of the chart. And what it's first going to do is try to put AZOIs over enemy HQs, if it can do the unneutralized ones over enemy HQs. And so it's obviously going to leave an air unit to take care of, oh, this unit was killed. So we take that off. Uh, MacArthur now is under an AZOI. Um, we have to leave an air unit to knock out Malaya. That was the next piece. Then the next piece of the logic is put an air unit with an AZOI over friendly HQs. And so we're going to leave an air unit over uh, South HQ to give it some defense. And then it says to couple up things, and it's very specific about for the Japanese, it's going to send this cruiser to hook up with a, a special naval landing force uh, for organic... Uh, uh, movement, transport, and you could have been with this one or that one. I just chose to put a Jolo. You could roll the dice if you are really strict about how these, how random you want these things to be. And then it's going to say put an air unit over any kind of enemy port. And here's an enemy port that we can get to. So it's going to put an air unit there. And then it's going to say for other units, it's going to say try to couple naval units at a port where there's an, a ground unit. And so that battleship's going to go back over to Hong Kong. And so we have now completed the first card of the game. So just to set things back, this was the Allied Hand uh, before we played the, uh, here you see the Australian Coast Watchers card, which we just played, but I just wanted to go back through this quickly. So 
again, I had um, off camera determined that the last two cards were going to be uh, this political card and this replacement card. And so they're the last two cards for the allied hand. We just played this. So this card goes out and War in Europe card comes in. Now, at this point, you could determine that you're going to stick with these two cards, but the War in Europe is actually on the list. And so this, again, following the logic, I can now decide to substitute this card for one of the last two cards because it is part of the logic, you know, that I'm saving. And again, I can change that if I, if I choose to, if, it, if something on the list comes up. And so, again, now I've got to say which one of these two cards goes back in. I'm rolling the dice up. And so this one is back in, and these two are going to be the last two cards played. So let me just preview what the bot would do for the first couple of cards for the allies. So if you look at the upper left, it's saying if you have more than two cards and either Southwest Pack or Malaya HQ are not out of supply, then it's going to try to get forces out of those locations into other locations. Uh, and so you can see right below it, under the green arrow, there's an evacuation uh, schedule. That's not going to happen because it is not true that um, those two are, um, are done. And so we're going to play the ABDA event, which is going down this, uh, this track here. Uh, and so you, when you play the event, the only thing it says is ABDA placement. And Tiji Latchap, which is where the Dutch usually have an air unit and a division, which is the best defended port they have, that's where the ABDA uh, HQ is going to go. And what, what I was doing here is that the, the, the bot here, the Erasmus ally, is playing historically that first you have the Arcadia Conference. It's going to the, the, they're going to implement this command structure. And then ultimately, you're going to play like Wavell, who is the, first com is the com one and only commander of ABDA. And Wavell is going to then, uh, going back to the top of this chart, after he gets established, he's going to start to set up his defenses in Burma and the, the China-Burma-India theater. And so that's kind of what the bot's going to do in the beginning. And then after that, the bot's going to pass, as you can see, for a bit. And then once it gets its passes out of the way, it's then going to, to start to, uh, you know, start to do things to uh, prevent, you know, looking to see if the uh, DEI is surrendered. There is later in the thing, it could actually try to uh, reinforce the, the Philippines or the DEI, if that's possible, in game turn three. But ultimately, it's just going to start to take shots. Uh, and, and you'll notice there's two green arrows. Basically, when you read through, you, you, again, you read through both of these, this box right here is the default. If nothing else, you're going to just start launching air and naval attacks where you can pull them off. And so you're going to start getting some of the U.S. Navy raiding strategy uh, on this side here. It's going to try to um, do some kind of, you know, reinforcement moves on the plain orange under very tight circumstances. Through the various cards, and uh, we're down to our last two cards. So it says, you know, in this upper right corner, it says if two or less cards, and so now we're into that set of conditions. And and one of the things that's important with these charts is you need to sort of study the charts a little bit because, you know, the if then statements and the number of arrows we could get into these very tight charts was limited. And so you, sometimes you're going to be asked to kind of bounce back to another part in the chart based on the words. So in this case, it says if two or less cards, if the, you're one space away from taking the DEI, it's going to say finish off the DEI, which is not going to be the case here because we were under a DEI neutralization strategy, and so that's not going to happen. Then it says check to see if you have achieved a defense perimeter strategy, else events. So we're now going to swing over. Let's see if we can do this cleverly. And... It, and the way you know where this is, is right above it, it says Defense Perimeter Strategy. And basically, it's going to say, do you have Guadalcanal, and have you placed New Guinea AZI over each objective port, if possible? If not, then in order given. So we need to go take Guadalcanal, and if that has already happened, that's fine. And then you have the New, the North, then it just shows you the various New Guinea options, and so you got to start putting, you know, taking and conquering AZOI ports, but of course, the the key variable here is you may have already used up your ASPs. There may be a whole lot of conditions that say that you can only go so far down that list. And so when you run out of options based on resources, you stop. I mean, you can only do as much as you can do uh, with what you've got, and it's impossible to predict it. But let's just say that 
taking Guadalcanal took up your last resource. And so now you've got one card left. So you've done something, you're, you use your second to last card to do something with this defense perimeter and you took Guadalcanal and maybe you took one or two other New Guinea ports and you got some AZOIs over some of those and then that's as far as you can go because you didn't only had so many activations on a, on a two card. And then the card that you would have used for that, if I now zoom in on the cards, is when you look at the list of events, the U.S. Army Navy uh, dispute card is actually on the list and this one isn't. So you would have used this card as a two card and you would have gotten four or five activations to do that south perimeter. So let's say that card got used. And then it would have been the Allied turn. And in their case, they actually would have played PT boats and they would have gotten another card in this situation. And now we would go back to the Japanese, and the Japanese would go, okay, I'm going to put the, uh, the, American, you know, the Allies under ISR. So this card would get played as an event as per the, per the instructions, and it, they would get a card. Oh, that's kind of cool. And since they're, the Allies are already under ISR, and we've already done as much as we can do, this would be coming, the play will ultimately will be this is going to go to the FOQ. When we go back over here, the Allied card is going to say, well, war in Europe, is going to get played, and this is going to get put in the FLQ, so the, so the bot's going to play this as an event, and of course going to get the extra reinforcement, which is going to be, really help it, and this is going to become the FLQ card, and so at the end of the turn, these are going to become FLQ cards, and the turn's over, and the logic plays out, and then you would just do the, the turn, and then there's a whole set of logic, which I'm now going to cut over to. And as you can see now in the shot, uh, it says reinforce and replacements, and so there's a whole bunch of logic about where HQs go, and where it, basically you're trying to put, you're trying to create an AZOI network. And by the way, this is covered in more detail in the rules that come with. There's a four-page rule booklet. It's actually three pages because one page is just a cover sheet. But you got three pages of of of, of uh, Erasmus rules, and it's it, there's a whole section on AZOI. Well, I'm going to leave it there. Now, when you open the box, at least you have a sense of what you can have a sense of what to start with and how to begin. Uh, I think you're going to find there's a lot of uh, fun times to be explored, learning the charts, and then you know implementing them as you play the game. So uh, please share your stories as you uh, create new narratives. And with that, I hope you enjoy the, the the second edition. And with that, this is Mark Herman signing off. Have a good one.